Are you a real estate photographer thinking about adding Matterport? Are you in a completely unrelated career and thinking about making the leap? How did an independent financial advisor transition to offering Matterport and related services? Stay tuned. Hi all, I'm Dan Smigrod, founder of the We Get Around Network Forum. Today is Thursday, November 7th, 2024. You're watching WGAN-TV Live at 5, a podcast for digital twin creators shaping the future of real estate today. We have an awesome show for you. My journey as a Matterport service provider, Daniel Brown with my Dancha. Our guest today is Osaka Japan-based Daniel Brown with my Dancha. Daniel, thank you for being on the show today. Ohio gozaimasu. Good morning. Ohio gozaimasu. Uh, uh, konnichiwa for being on the show today. Oh, that's right. It's afternoon there. Yeah. Um, uh, Daniel, how about telling us about the services that you offer today? So Mei Dansha is a provider of cutting edge 3D spatial imaging solutions in Japan. Uh, Mei Dansha's concept is to enrich people's lives through next generation spatial imaging. Uh, we offer 3D virtual tours, uh, drone services, 360 degree virtual tours, uh, point cloud capture services, uh, product scanning, and some software solutions. Um, the 3D virtual tours uh, is probably what's talked about most on uh, uh, the We Get Around network. Uh, we create immersive and interactive digital twins of properties, perfect for architecture, construction, and hospitality. Uh, we use the Matterport Pro 2 camera. Uh, we also enhance that with the Leica BLK 360 uh, for large scale projects. And we usually use uh, Matterport for our 3D virtual tours. However, lately I'm considering trying some other tools because there's a potential market for showcasing Japanese real estate to Chinese clients who at the moment cannot access Matterport. Well, let's uh, we go was... back to your services for, for a moment, sure. Daniel. Yeah. Um, I, I want to say I heard 3D, 360, digital twins, virtual tours. I, I think mm -hmm. I heard a lot of different terms. So could you just kind of expand on what does that mean as opposed to I offer Matterport? Okay, so I just mentioned, I just explained now what we do with Matterport. But um, if I was to take this last year and the work that we've been doing, uh, Matterport has probably been about a third of what we've been doing. Uh, we've had kind of requests to do unusual things that are just not possible with Matterport at the moment. Uh, so to give you an example, uh, we uh, offer drone services, but in particular, uh, we offer it with uh, 360 panoramas. Uh, and also we use uh, drone photography to create uh, 3D of um, landscapes and roofs as well. Uh, these sort of things kind of can be done with Matterport in some ways, but they're very difficult to do that way. So we've been using things like reality capture and um, uh, 3D Vista to assist those things. Uh, also, we use um, uh, high, we make high resolution 360 degree panoramas. In particular, a job this year we request were, were request, requested to make an example of a 360 panorama before and after. A renovation so it could have been done with Matterport with the kind of embedding embedding but uh, the client wanted to show it on a big screen uh, for presentations so what we did is we created high resolution panoramas in like 20k width uh, using a mirrorless camera and uh, we did as I said before before and after and use 3d vista so you could compare before and after the renovation um, point cloud capture services, I also mentioned, we use Matterport to generate the point cloud because it's the cheapest solution, um, as opposed to using Leica's uh, subscription software, which is quite expensive. Um, we use Matterport combined with the Leica for that, um, for just paying for the E57 or the XYZ uh, through the Matterpack. You can. That's um, the uh, the Leica BLK360. That's correct. Yeah. One, first generation. Uh, that's the one. And so you're using that in conjunction with the Matterport uh, platform. That's right. Um, when we do it to generate point cloud, um, the client doesn't usually need the walkthrough 
3D digital twin tour or whatever you want to call it. They just need the point cloud. Um, we've been using that uh, for generating, for instance, the uh, exterior of a building. And we then, uh, in the last year, we've had a case where um, we sell that on to a artist, a 3D artist, who uses it to create uh, like a world in metaverse, in, in the metaverse. So yeah, these kinds of uses sort of have been popping up from time to time recently. And because we already had the technology from making 3D virtual tours, uh, it's been a good uh, secondary kind of income source. Also on Point Cloud, have you heard of Cupix? Yes. Yeah. Cupix is very fast and it can be done with uh, regular 360 cameras like the Insta360 series of cameras. Uh, these generate a very kind of low grade point cloud, but the speed uh, is an important element there. So in the last year, we've had clients who wanted uh, a scan of the inside of a furnace, for instance, but uh, the furnace can only be entered for like 10 or 15 minutes at a time. So yeah, the Cupix is the ideal solution there because just waving the camera around or strapping it to a drone uh, is enough to get you a full scan of the furnace in about 10 or 15 minutes. So yeah, these sort of solutions uh, have been popping up in the last 12 months, which is sort of, uh, whereas the last few years, we've been really concentrating on Matterport 3D tours in general, we're starting to get a situation where um, uh, we get these sort of secondary services making more and more of our, uh, our sales in general. Okay. And finally, um, we offer some software solutions. Uh, for instance, we heard about assets and MP embed uh, through the We Get Around network. And uh, we've been um, uh, doing in talks with these companies and uh, we are at the um, uh, support desk provider for uh, Japan for these two companies. Isn't that cool? So you're, yeah. you're providing uh, providing it with in Japanese or just the the advantage of the time difference being on the other side of the planet than our set and MP embed? Uh, Japanese, because, um, well, some of the clients could possibly provide someone uh, to speak in English, but there would always be uh, the risk of loss of uh, something lost in communication, if you know what I mean. So having someone who speaks Japanese in Japan uh, is, a, is a time benefit, the time zone benefit, and also the language benefit there too, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, did I hear photos as part of your services? Yes, uh, sometimes as an extra, uh, we provide photo regular photographs uh, for our clients. For instance, uh, if I was to talk about categories of clients, uh, we do do some, a lot of work for home building companies. Uh, the home building companies were in a situation where they were provide uh, employing a regular cameraman. Uh, to do photos of the, of the house, as well as asking me to do the 3D of the inside. So that was uh, like a secondary cost. So I said I, we could throw in some pictures of the uh, exterior of the buildings because that's something that Matterport doesn't provide on its own. So yeah, we um, use a DSLR or a mirrorless camera to provide the uh, exterior photos. And the interior photos are mostly provided from the Matterport tour itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, the the categories of clients that you're providing these various digital marketing services to are? Yeah, uh, in terms of um, the jobs we've done this year outside of the building companies, uh, we've also done a lot of work for uh, the public sector, like uh, city tourism boards, uh, and also in the past, some um, national government uh, projects. Uh, so. In particular, these um, city tourism boards, we've been doing work for MICE, which is meetings, incentives, conventions, and uh, exhibitions that could sort of for large uh, group orientated tourism. Uh, so for instance, recently, and I'd like to introduce it later, uh, we did a big project for a convention center in Kobe, which is a city close to where I am in Osaka. Uh, also, for in the public sector, we have been documenting uh, for 
marketing purposes, sort of reconstruction of ancient buildings, uh, that sort of thing, like a like a big castle or a temple or something like that. Um, it's not used so much for uh, uh, the building administration, but more for uh, advertising the process uh, to taxpayers, I guess, is the best way to put it. Outside of the public sector and the home building companies, we've done a lot of work this year for uh, hospitality. Uh, in particular, mainly through agencies, we've been getting requests to uh, photograph uh, in 360 high resolution and also in 3D for uh, big hotels, uh, for seasons and uh, Hyatt, etc. This sort of work is uh, done through agencies uh, and often foreign agencies as in outside of Japan. Um, yeah, uh, also through advertising agencies as in local agencies, uh, we often get requests to document uh, display booths that are used in exhibitions. Uh, when the Olympics was on uh, in 2021 here in Japan, uh, there was a lot of demand to photograph pavilions uh, that sort of popped up all over Tokyo, especially because people weren't actually able to visit them at the time uh, because of the COVID restrictions. So we did some uh, a lot of work uh, documenting pavilions for an oil company in Japan band called Enios and also uh, a sports shoemaker called ASICS, uh, and another one for a television station called Wow Wow. And finally, I mentioned the industrial clients earlier uh, when I said uh, that we did the inside of furnaces. So on behalf of um, a, cl a client that uh, does the maintenance for these plants, we've been getting these uh, very, very fast-paced jobs as I mentioned before, scanning done in 15 minutes and then afterwards uh, taking back the data and uh, creating point clouds. And I also forgot to mention, but we um, we send those point clouds to uh, a, uh, a partner that we met for your network, uh, the We Get Around Network. Uh, the partner's name is he's in Vietnam. It's uh, Buyers Any is the name of the company. So they put together for us a, a simple bin uh, based on the, the uh, simple point cloud that we sent them. And that's been a pretty uh, regular business for us this last 12 months. So we're very pleased that we met this partner for your network and also this client as well. Uh, forgive me, the category for that client is industrial? I I claim, I say industrial clients. Uh, uh, it's kind of a niche market, but uh, they do uh, maintenance on plants. And that's what they do, uh, as in uh, chem not chemical, but um, well, all round plants, yeah, industrial and, plants. And they're looking for a, a BIM model of their client's facility? That's correct, yes. How, how would they use a BIM model of a client's facility? Is that for training purposes? I think mainly they use it just as an add-on to justify their services and their costs, et cetera. Uh, because uh, many of the plants that we are scanning don't actually have BIM to start with. Uh, they only have regular uh, DWG two-dimensional diagrams of the buildings. So what we usually do is we receive these diagrams from them, so we have a base to start with, and then we provide the um, point cloud on top of that. So what happens is we can get an idea uh, of what the inside of the furnace looks like now as opposed to the way it was designed. Uh, the inside of the furnace, no one, I don't think many of our viewers have actually seen the inside of a furnace before, but it's caked several inches thick with um, uh, soot, uh, with um, ash, that sort of thing. Um, it's quite hazardous to be in there, so you can only spend 10 or 15 minutes in there at a time. Uh, but yeah, we go in there with the drone with a Insta360 camera strapped to it and uh, just fly it straight up the furnace and then straight back down again. And that provides us with a sort of a cylindrical point cloud of the inside. And we can from there measure how narrow the um, inside is. And from there, we can understand just how much soot, how much ash is caked on the sides of the building. And also the primary purpose from what I understand is to see if any of the bricks that support the furnace in the inside are coming loose. So yeah, we've been doing this at a, a number of locations in Japan this last 12 months.
So that would be us for maintenance where where your BIM model? No. Is uh, I think the BIM is not essential for uh, getting an idea of what the inside looks like now. That more the point cloud. Uh, the point but, cloud. So the point cloud the, is, mm. is helping uh, your client understand. Oh, there's about ten inches worth of soot that needs yes. to come off yeah. because they can calculate uh, what the furnace was new versus yes. uh, well the the wall is now ten inches thicker than it was. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you actually go into the furnace? No, no. You send your drone in there with with a 360 camera strap to. Uh, yeah, you actually have to go in there because um, the furnace's walls are very thick, so you can't control the drone from the outside. Um, and we've had an issue in some of the furnaces where the um, the walls actually block the GPS sensors, so the drone itself can't fly straight inside the um, inside the furnace. So we've sort of come up with some my ingenious kind of ways of doing things like for instance lowering the insta360 camera on a rope uh, from the top of the furnace down uh, and at other times putting it on a three or four meter pole and then slowly raising it up etc yeah there's been a, a few um, on the site sort of problem solving things that we've had to do but the basic technology in the way we take things back and process the data afterwards doesn't change so how do you create that point cloud? It's going from the 360 is, uh, wh which platform are you using? Uh, yeah, I mentioned uh, Cupix, which yes. as I understand is incorporated in San Jose in the US, but actually is run from Korea. Uh, the, um, the company has some really interesting solutions in terms of, um, generating 3D uh, like OBJ files, et cetera. So it's very low cost just to produce these, um, just to produce these uh, 3D uh, scans, I guess, but it's not very useful as a, um, like a real estate tour or something like that, because uh, it's the, the 3D is pretty rough like it is with Matterport, but it, the, the photograph quality is not as good as the Matterport tours. And also the link between uh, locations where the photographs are uh, is uh, kind of, um, how do we say, uh, difficult to control. Uh, well, I think what I'm hearing, you're not using Cupix for marketing purposes. You're oh, of course not, no, no. Specifically for the uh, the, the uh, cloud that it can be created. I presume sure. you're using Cupix Works. That's correct. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, which is written about a lot in the We Get Around Network forum. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> We've done a number of uh, uh, WGA and TV podcasts with the Cupix team. Oh, well, really? I, I must have missed that one. Sorry. Uh, um, well, I think we've done something like 200. And I think our the, today's episode is number 232. So I could imagine you haven't watched all uh 232 hours of, of <laughs> now that you mentioned i do recall something i do recall yeah. something yeah and i do remember speaking to a person in the u.s about it yeah yeah um in terms of other client categories e even if you would because i know you've been in business five years and we'll, we'll go back to the beginning of time but when you think about clients over the last five years uh <laughs> in terms of categories uh, let, let's see if I can just break it down, go a little bit slower. In fact, uh, you talked about tourism. What would be the application for uh, your tourism clients? Uh, so our tourism clients, uh, if I was to go back five years, uh, that's where we started. Uh, but initially, because we were just starting out and we didn't have uh, the connections that we do have now, uh, it was like uh, Airbnb pensions, uh, that sort of thing. And generally, those Airbnb pensions were renovated houses uh, made by building companies looking for or side projects. Um, at the time, we couldn't put Matterport on a uh, on a um, Airbnb site. I think that's changed recently. Yes, but... today you can do it on a VRBO and ah, yeah. Um, um... 
uh, it's going to escape me, but uh, I'll, yeah. um, I'll, when we put captions on the show, we'll, we'll just fill in these words with the, uh, <laughs> the, the other names. I'd like yeah. to know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, what we started there with tourism, but uh, Corona or COVID really knocked out all of those, um, those industries. And in a way that sort of led to home building companies because uh, from there, these sort of um, pensions were all on the market for sale. Uh, so that was the first time we'd really done anything for real yeah, estate. But, in, yeah. in fact, uh, well, let, let's go back to the beginning. And, and so we'll, we'll pick it up there. Uh, sure. How did Matterport first show up on your radar? Um, it's an, an interesting story. Uh, so when we purchased our Pro 2 camera, although the company is uh, uh, incorporated in 2019, uh, the camera was bought in 2017. So it's our foundational investment uh, to offer a high quality 3D virtual tour service. And the adoption was driven by my late business partner. Uh, incidentally, his name is also Daniel, as in his name was Danny. We, we just call him Danny because make it easier. Um, yeah, so Danny was from the US and he'd heard about uh, Matterport uh, through uh, people he was associated with here in Japan, other, other American people. And uh, he came to me uh, one day in 2017 saying he was going to start a new business. And so I watched from a distance for a couple of years. Uh, and uh, in 2019, I recommended uh, a client to him. It was uh, a client that I knew through uh, another business that I was in. Well, and, what, what, what were you yeah. doing at the time when when your your friend Danny said, hey, yeah. I'm going to start this business around Matterport. I'm going to buy a Matterport Pro 2 camera. Uh, what were you doing at the time? I was uh, what we call in Japan as an uh, independent financial advisor, which uh, mainly I dealt in equity sales. So selling stocks on the market and uh, calling people to buy and sell, uh, so-called retail uh, retail stockbroking. Um, yeah, so I was independent. You did that a number of years because b before you were independent, you were, you were providing those services for uh, a company in Japan. That's correct. So for five and a half years, I was salaried working for a company. Uh, and then after that, I went independent for about three or four years afterwards. And there was sort of a gray time in between when I was sort of half doing what I am now and half doing uh, that work. So that half time that I'm talking about is uh, in 2019. So at the time, uh, in general, this sort of business of calling people uh, to buy and trade stocks uh, is sort of a declining market in Japan. The stock market itself is going up, but the people with both the time and the money to pick up the phone and talk about stocks and then make trades, has sort of been declining for years. So uh, it sounds I like was you looking... were looking for something else at the time. Exactly. And and here comes your friend Danny. And what did you initially think when he showed you a Matterport tour? Um, to be honest, I was impressed with the tour, but more I, what I was concerned about was that Danny had been a university teacher for like five, ten years. So I he'd never been in a position where he'd sold something, if you know what I mean. So he, he wanted, uh, he was already selling some things with some success, uh, but uh, he wanted my help to find more clients. So one of my clients uh, was the, um, uh, the general manager of a facility, which is very old, it's like a hundred year old uh, restaurant uh, in, um, in Osaka. Uh, so the group that owns the, the company, the group that owns the restaurant is a, uh, is a hotel chain. Uh, so I introduced him to that place and we got the deal uh, to do this 100-year-old restaurant, which is like a, uh, a nationally registered uh, uh, cultural cultural asset or something like that. And uh, yeah, we scanned the building right before it was used in the the summit, the, um, uh, how do we call it? Um, the, um, uh, the international summit of the G7. So uh, the the wives of the uh, 
of the presidents and prime ministers and so on met there for their summit. Um, at any rate, um, it was used just beforehand to show what kind of building it would be to those um, in the G7 countries. And it was also used afterwards to advertise the facility. Cool. Very interesting use case. And it was yeah. used on an international basis for people to pre-tour space without physically getting on a plane. Yes, exactly. And it was right before COVID. And that was uh, really important because for me, it showed me that there are uh, serious companies, uh, not just people may, uh, dealing in Airbnb, uh, could actually use this. And that's when I decided I have to put more effort into this work than my stockbroking. And uh, yeah, Danny was ecstatic that we got the deal. And uh, in 2000, at the end of that year in 2019, uh, we incorporated and made a company. And yeah, unfortunately, uh, the next year, just uh, in, I think it was April or early May in 2020, Danny actually passed away. So since then, I've been running the show. Sorry for your loss. Yeah, it's a long time ago now. So it sounds like uh, COVID now enters the picture. Oh, yeah. Um, COVID at first knocked us out for like three, four months uh, until we knew uh, what kind of approach to take. But uh, a chance meeting with a person from uh, the biggest advertising agency in Japan, a company called Dentsu, uh, would lead to me doing a presentation at their uh, uh, local headquarters here in Osaka. And from there, uh, we were we got contracts to do home building companies, like large scale home building companies, and we travelled the country, uh, doing I think it was in total sixty one locations, uh, and then from there, other projects that I mentioned, like documenting uh, government, major government institution sort of reconstruction of ancient buildings. Uh, also, yeah, the Olympics came up the following year because it had been delayed from 2020 to 2021. And the pavilions that I mentioned before, they were all through uh, that dance of the um, advertising agency. That was a, a good chance meeting. It was for sure. Um, it's not and, something that you proactively yeah. pursued. It's something where the opportunity came to you. Um, I'm just, I was just so my mind was just so full of what we could do with this technology at the time uh, in uh, late 2019, early 2020. So literally every person I met, I would talk to about this. And um, in general, that my, my wife would tell me to shut up, but uh, it just happened to be I told the right person. Um, and uh, yeah, that led to uh, the chance meeting and uh, the presentation at, uh, at the advertising agency and the work that we got afterwards. So literally just by telling everyone you possibly could that you came into contact with, someone helped make a connection for you with, with, with ultimately a super large uh, client of yours. Yes, uh, I think you've really got to believe in what you're doing um, and someone's going to see that and they're going to reward you, if you know what I mean. At, at that point, um, were you providing any other services other than Matterport? At that point, purely we were using the Matterport Pro 2 camera. That was it. Uh, so that it was, was 100% we at some point, a Matterport, uh, using a Matterport Pro 2 camera was 100% of your business. That was correct. In fact, the business itself was still very small. Uh, the two of us were only doing, I think if you take into account exchange rates, uh, we were still doing only about... I guess about $10,000 to $30,000 a year uh, in scans. But uh, yeah, the following year, that would uh, triple. That's that's kind of the, the kind of scale of work that we were doing. And, and why did that happen? Was that a result of COVID or, or something else? In a way, it was a result of COVID because uh, I think about 60 to 70% of the scans were places that benefited, benefited from... Uh, having a Matterport tour, but others were just, uh, how do I say, it's a new thing and they wanted something new, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. But yeah, in the years since we've refined what we do and offering all the kinds of other services that I've mentioned, 
And although that does impact a bit on the um, on the profit that we get from these jobs, because you need extra software subscriptions or new cameras, uh, it has actually widened uh, the uh, number of uh, industries that we can service because uh, we have uh, all kinds yeah. of new technology that makes a 3D virtual tour a lot more attractive to them. Uh, Daniel, if you could expand on that, because I, I think up until that point of time, we were talking about a Matterport Pro 2 camera. But That's I, I think if we fast forward to today, uh, either of you could talk about what gear you're using today or in that timeline of just telling your story and progressing forward when you started adding gear and why. Sure. Um, everything we bought was, there was always a reason we bought it. Uh, so if the, I go through it in, in order, uh, the second camera that we bought was the Leica BLK, the generation one BLK. And the reason was at the time, well, there was no Pro 3 to start with. Uh, it was in 2020. Uh, we wanted to expand uh, our capabilities uh, to do large scale projects. Uh, I mentioned before uh, that a major government department uh, was doing a reconstruction of a ancient building. The trouble is that it's half outdoor. Uh, it's cut, surrounded in scaffolding and uh, natural sunlight pours into the, uh, the location. And it's huge, not just width wise, but on several levels uh, going up. So we were getting to like 700 scan points and the Pro 2 was just not placing them accurately. Uh, more to the point, sunlight would suddenly stream in uh, through the um, through the scaffolding and make certain areas uh, unscannable at the time. Um, yeah, so we, at the time, because uh, it was COVID. Just for uh, clarification for, for our viewers, a Matterport Pro 2 camera uh, is not really designed for outdoor use case. Yes, absolutely. Period, paragraph, um, end of sentence. It was before Matterport came out with Matterport Pro 3 camera that could be yes. used outdoors and also uh, scan at great distance. So yes. uh, that's when you bought the BLK360 Generation 1 camera, which works with the Matterport platform. Works just like connecting the BLK to your iPad as you would a, um, a Matterport Pro 2 camera. That's correct. Um, I think the Pro 2 camera is simply the best invention that Matterport has ever made. Even the Pro 3 doesn't come close. But as you say, um, it's just not made to work outdoors uh, or on big scale. Um, the quality of the photo is amazing. And that battery lasting nine hours is just made for real estate photographers. Um, but so yeah, it was becoming a stumbling block. What, what, what was next that ended up in uh, buying yet another piece of gear? Well, if I was to sort of go back to the BLK a little bit, um, the, the BLK, uh, we never used it alone uh, because the quality of the photo is not so great. But yeah, the quality of the 3D is like the best you can get with Matterport, like even more than the Pro 3. So yeah, even today, uh, we may only just take three or four scans or maybe 10 uh, with the BLK, but the rest of the work we'll do with the Pro 2. But just having that be okay there gets us jobs that we wouldn't have otherwise been able to get. Um, yeah, other cameras, uh, it's more recent, but uh, I haven't mentioned in the clients we cater for real estate. Uh, and that's because we've had trouble uh, trying to crack the real estate photography market in Japan. Specifically residential real estate. Specifically residential. Um, the biggest, there are probably two or three reasons it's difficult in Japan. Uh, one is there's a bigger emphasis on uh, new construction as opposed to uh, homes uh, that are resold. Uh, the second is that uh, the Japanese equivalent, equivalent of the MLS, it's called RAINS in Japan, uh, unfortunately only caters for JPEG photos. So uh, if we were to put up uh, a 360 tour or, or a 3D tour of a, of a building, uh, it would only be able to be used by the selling agent or like um, the, um, yeah, the selling agent. So in general, the buying agents don't really want to, you have anything with the selling agents branding or links back to the selling agents website. So this is sort of um, a big stumbling block there. 
And the the third issue we, we found with real estate is that uh, the contract system here is very different. So it's very open and free. So it means that uh, anyone who's capable of selling the home is able to sell the home. Uh, that means there's not a great incentive to spend a lot of money on uh, photographing, videoing, or making 3D tours of the building. That said, uh, we tried to find uh, a better price point uh, to make real estate uh, photography feasible in Japan. So we picked up the Ricoh Theta Z1. Uh, we've had some use with it, but unfortunately, we've still not been able to crack the, uh, the real estate market here in Japan. But incidentally, my reason for buying the Z1 was uh, Ben Claremont's tutorial series, which I watched through uh, uh, your network, um, VR Tour Pro. Um, it is an uh, easy camera to use uh, when you've been accustomed to using uh, DSLR three, for making 360 photos. And yeah, the cost point is a lot lower. So yeah, it's a really good camera to use if you're wanting to do uh, buildings on scale. That's That's what I noticed. So you purchased it solely to see if you could break into residential real estate. That didn't happen. That's correct. Um, um, but along the way, you ended up buying a number of in Insta360 cameras. That's correct. Uh, Insta360, I just wanted to try out to see if we could do something with 360 video. But in reality, we would end up using the Insta360 cameras uh, to do the Cupix uh, that I talked about before, uh, the 3D scans of the insides of the furnaces. Also, uh, a recent use that I've been trying, uh, it's, not, it's not the photogrammetry of buildings, but rather the photogrammetry of items. Uh, you can strap a number of these cameras to a pole and then walk around an object. Then you can reframe the video afterwards to focus on that object. And then you've got uh, simultaneously three or four videos from different angles of an object. You can take this uh, these videos into reality capture, and then you can make a photogrammy uh, a photogrammetry model of the object that you were just walking around. So it's they're pretty useful and they're really really cost effective. So yeah, I love these cameras. They're just fun to play with. That's that's probably the best way to put it. Yeah. You bought the Insta 360s. I, I had a note. It was an Insta 360 One uh, R and X3 and X4. Was, was this all related to the video capture uh, that either for Cupix or uh, using your drone workflow um, plus Cupix to uh, end up with point clouds? That's correct. Um, the One R etc. is not supported by Cupix. Um, but as I mentioned before, um, they're a very cheap camera, so you can strap them to that pole that I mentioned and make uh, photogrammetry. Uh, the X3, uh, initially we, is the camera I bought. Uh, I bought that expecting to be able to do something with 360 video. Um, it didn't happen, but I did use it to showcase to a client once what a 360 uh, virtual tour of a building would look like uh, mm -hmm. by walking around their premises with it. Um, and so that actually got me a job, but we didn't actually use it on the job. Um, then recently, Cubix has uh, uh, updated their support uh, for the platform. So the X3 will not be supported for much longer. Uh, so we bought an X4 uh, for that purpose. And also, I wanted to see what 8K 360 video would look like. And, and when did the uh, did you end up buying a drone? The drone was bought on a hope that we would find work. Uh, we're using uh, drone three sixties, etc., and it did take a long time. Uh, we bought the drone back in, I think it was twenty twenty one. So it was a Mavic Pro two, a Mavic two Pro, uh, and yeah, from there uh, a licensing system was introduced in Japan. So uh, I got my license, uh, that took a while. Uh, then there are other sort of administrative hurdles you have to go through. But finally, all those things cleared. Uh, just this last 12 months, we're starting to get work uh, creating 3D uh, with the drone by bringing uh, drone video or drone photographs into reality capture. Also uh, doing 360s uh, in RAW and then uh, processing them and making 360 panoramas. 
uh, these two things uh, we've been using the drone for this year. So finally, we've got our money back on the on the training and the drone itself. Was the was was the drone work aside from being inside the uh, the furnace furnace that you were describing? Was is the drone mostly been uh, aerial three D or three sixty mapping? Aerial three sixty is the most common use that we've been doing it using it for. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then, and at some point, uh, I, uh, you were using a DSLR to shoot 360s. So that's correct, right? So you're 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 taking what four, five, six, eight shots around. How many shots around were you taking? About that many. Um, so and I think Japanese you using, houses aren't that big. Yeah, and so you were using PD, PT GUI for stitching these images. That's correct. Together. Yeah. So uh, the then workflow, yeah, needs a number of different software. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and, then, and then where did those images end up? In what platform? Okay. Uh, we use 3D Vista, which I have, which I had heard about on your, um, on your network. And in particular, there's a man, uh, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but um, he ha has been posting on your forum um some of his work with 3d vista and he had a, a slider from side to side where you mm -hmm. compare two panoramas um obviously you want two panoramas of the same spot but you could compare like day and night or in our case uh we got a, a job uh to compare before and after a renovation of the interior of a building so at a space of about three to six months uh in between shoots uh, we would mark the point that we scanned at uh, on a, a floor plan of the building and um, not scan, photographed at, I'm sorry. And uh, we'd use uh, the process you just mentioned, uh, taking still shots with the three with the um, uh, DSLR uh, with a fisheye lens. And uh, we then compare those two photographs uh, before and after using 3D vistas. I think it's called... Um, stereo uh no not stereo or or split split panorama or something like that mm -hmm. yeah. is this uh, kevin dole with home 3d.us uh actually no uh it was a man an older man uh who uh did a lot of um um separately he did, he showed some examples of a uh of a small town making a small town's map uh using another software but he also had examples of 3d vista slider i'm sorry his name escapes me but mm -hmm. yeah that was a that was the influence there and no one in japan is doing anything like that so uh i had a quest a question one day is there a solution that's not metaport the client had reasons um that's not metaport that can that could compare before and after uh the um uh, renovation process and so I said yeah sure I've got something for you <laughs> and uh, yeah that's how the job started what and what was the purpose of looking at the before and after how was the client using that technique yeah so uh, the client that we service was an advertising agency but the ultimate client was a subsidiary of a building company um, the building company is a pretty big building company uh, in Japan and particularly here in Osaka uh, the building company has a, a sort of a business where they build a whole uh, apartment condominium building. And then afterwards, they take care of like the garbage and that sort of stuff. Uh, the, the actual individual apartments are sold, but um, afterwards they buy back some of the apartments as well. So they bought back two of the apartments of uh, an older apartment building, an older condominium building that they had made. And they wanted to renovate them to make them more modern. So they wanted to show two things. One, just how their renovations look. And two, uh, they actually wanted to sell the apartment afterwards. So they wanted to use the uh, the results to sort of sell the building, mm -hmm. uh, sell the room, I should say. Um, so at any rate, yeah, they were looking for something new and it couldn't be Matterport because they already had uh, a photographer that does Matterport for them. And for some reason, I think possibly they were exclusively contracted to this person. So they needed a solution that was not Matterport. So for that sort of 
uh, contractual reason, uh, we came up with 3D Vista for them. Uh, and uh, uh, what is the, the largest project that you've done with 3D Vista? Largest project. Uh, we've done projects with 3D Vista that are complementary to large projects like um, uh, with 3D tours. Like, for instance, uh, a project we did for Kobe, uh, Kobe City. Uh, their tourism board has a big mice facility uh, convention center. Um, we use 3D Vista to make the sort of home screen uh, of the tour. And from there, you can choose individual Matterport scans to fly into. Um, you have that's this tour available. Project. Could you can you show show us this tour? Sure. Uh, let me get it on my screen there. When it, I want to say that it's uh, uh, in fact even while you're you're, you're setting up, so that uh, if, if you want to visit uh, Daniel's uh, website, uh, madasha cocom That's www m is in Mary, E-I-D-A-N-S-H-A hyphen C-O dot C-O-M. Um, I, I, uh, t tell us about this tour. It's a, it's a very large project. Sure. Um, can you see it on your screen yes. at the moment? Sure. Okay. So this was created using 3D Vista and uh, Google's mapping tiles. Uh, they didn't have the budget for 3D scanning this large area but it does illustrate what the client wanted uh, displayed. In particular, this is a monorail running through the middle and um, the client uh, has this monorail station, which you can walk off and then enter these four facilities that you can see marked with these uh, uh, lines and uh, writing at the top here. So, Apologies because it's in Japanese, but um, they are respectively uh, the Kobe International Meeting Hall, uh, the Kobe International Exhibition Halls. There's two of there's three of them, and each of them are really really big buildings. I think there's a combined um, uh, square footage of something like four hundred thousand square feet or something like that. Um, so we wanted a method to sort of put it all into one package, which is why I came up with the idea of using 3D Vista. And the client, uh, we were one of the tenders that were putting in our proposal. Uh, we were the only one that proposed something like this. And um, they went for it because uh, you can see the- Is it clickable? Way... Yeah, uh, it's clickable. You can either click on these uh, buttons here or click on the writing uh, on these spots. Um, it takes a little while to load. So I'll show you some examples that I opened earlier. Okay. Just one moment. So this is inside uh, the meeting hall. So there are meeting rooms and a big theater uh, inside uh, this building. Uh, I think altogether uh, it's six Forgive floors. me, Daniel. So we went from 3D Vista to... Matterport, and then you have a menu on the left, which is this is MP Embed. Yeah. Okay. Um, MP Embed we've been using since 2020, yes, 2020. Um, because at the time Matterport didn't have a menu like this. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we had issues with some clients that said, Yeah, Matterport's great, it makes the building look good but we want to show the content of the building. Is there some way that we can sort of index the content? And so that's when we found MP Embed and we've been okay. using them since 2020. Uh, How'd, and you as find I mentioned before. How'd you find MP Embed? Yes, I found them for you. Uh, at the time, uh, the previous owner uh, had created a number of uh, explanatory videos uh, which you can still find at uh, We Get Around Networks uh, University, I think it's called. Yeah, yeah. the uh, WGAN TV Training Academy. That's correct. Yep. Um, the um, So can we fly into a spot? Show us. Sure, let's fly in. Uh, okay, so I think personally, uh, I like the, um, the big amphitheater at the bottom. So we'll go have a look at that. Once I work out how to press the buttons. 
Here we go. So as you can see, so so far I've heard you that you've blended three platforms: 3D Vista, Matterport, MP Embed. Were there yet other? And then there was Google, uh, Google Earth. Yeah, um, tiles from Google Earth. That's correct. Uh huh. Any other technologies that you used on this one? Uh, I guess if you were to say one more, uh, I'm going to have to jump to a different room. Uh, but um, we have some 360 panoramas that we created using the DSLR. So, and why did you use a DSLR rather than doing Matterport of that? Um, there's a big uh, gap in time between when we took the shots and um, did the 3D scan. So the project itself, uh, there's four buildings all similar scale to, to what you see here. Um, so as you can imagine, it would have taken a long time. Uh, altogether, we spent three months, probably 30 scanning days uh, doing the facilities. But in between, there were events being held at the facility. So often we would have to scan a location and then we would only be halfway through doing a room. And then the next opportunity to scan would be like three, three weeks later or something like that. Mm -hmm. So this kind of proposed lots of challenges. Which I'll probably I, I want to later. ask you about that, but is there anything be, before we take it off screen share? Was there something that you wanted to, to show us in particular? Uh, sure. Um, probably just the the size of some of these places. So if I if I show you one more of the exhibition halls, yeah, this is not the largest, but uh, if you have a look, these big empty spaces, these sort of provided a number of challenges. Um, I'm going like to imagine you shot later. that space with a, a BLK 360 first generation. I can't imagine that you had any success with the Matterport Pro 2 camera. Um, with the Matterport Pro 2 camera, you can sort of attack the edges yeah. of, of the, um, of the uh, facility. But yeah. as soon as you go more than two or three meters into the facility, uh, the camera just gives up. Yeah. yeah. But uh, you know, I I, I like uh, I, I like that we looked at this because I I think it kind of gives the the scale and the scope of of what you um, five years later since starting your your business um, you're, you're able to do a four hundred thousand square foot space uh, blend in three D Vista Matterport uh, uh, MP Embed use two different uh, three four different cameras I think that you used a uh, Matterport Pro I, two camera correct. BLK three sixty first generation camera, uh, a DSLR. Um, uh, incidentally, which DSLR are you, do you presently shoot with? I'm using Sony. Sony, uh, you're, you're Sony, using a mirrorless yeah. camera. That's correct. Mir mirrorless, uh, fisheye lens, stitching in PT GUI. Uh, where, and where are those images going? Right to 3D Vista? Um, there's a few steps in between. Uh, I recommend anyone who's interested to watch uh, Ben Claremont's VR Tour Pro, uh, which do you still offer a, um, an incentive there? Yes, for Virtual Tour Pro uh, by Ben Claremont. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll put a comment in the show notes uh, with, with a special offer for that. Um, so that was helpful to you in terms of how you were Very. figuring out your workflow mm -hmm. on this particular project. Uh, and I also heard, uh, I want to say that you also used the 360 camera, though I wasn't clear on on which camera or why. Um, on this particular project, uh, we didn't use uh, a 360 camera that we not accepting, so I, of course, uh, the, the Matterport cameras, cameras and the Leica. The, the, uh, mirror, the mirrorless doing with the fisheye um, rotating the, the uh, stitching all those images together. Uh, Pro 2, like a BLK, 400,000 square feet. Uh, uh, could you just touch on some of the challenges? You, you mentioned a few, yeah, which, yeah, which were large open space. Uh, you're not going to be able to use that Matterport Pro 2 to do a sp space that has nothing unique uh, for the camera to kind of grab hold of. Uh, you, you mentioned that you were shooting around uh, events. 
Uh, so you needed to wait for different parts of the building to become available to, to scan. Um, other challenges on that particular project? Um, there were a number, but we were fortunate that, uh, let me say first, that the client uh, had done a lot of research about uh, 3D tours, and in particular Matterport. They actually gave us, uh, when um, they were asking for tenders, they actually uh, gave us a, a sheet of requirements, and they actually said that areas where the ceiling is more than 20 meters high, we require the Leica BLK 360 Generation 1 to be used in the, that many words. Um, so it was it was quite surprising to see such an informed client. Um, but Did at any rate... Did you have the, the um, BLK 360 at that time? Sorry? Did you have the BLK 360? Oh, yes, we did. Um, did. This was so, so you were very happy that that was part of the, the scope oh, yes. of the uh, project because, it, well, it, check it, that it, box. I have that at that time. Exactly. Probably a $21,000 scanner. Yes. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Many yen. Yeah. Many yen. But uh, may, may I say that they were very communicative throughout the whole process and very helpful. Um, so kind of challenges that we had, or their needs first, uh, they were looking for a way to promote the meeting halls and exhibition halls uh, to local and international businesses and organizations uh, that we would consider holding events in Western Japan. Because uh, this area of Western Japan, in a space of like one hour train, train ride either way, there are three or four big cities. Um, so there's plenty of uh, choice as far as facilities go uh, to host big events. So they wanted uh, to promote uh, the uh, ease of use of this Kobe facility, right? Um, so in particular, its closeness to the train station uh, was an important factor and they wanted that shown somehow. So we did that with the Google tiles. Um, also the size of the spaces, uh, so these are pretty big spaces. I mean, there are slightly bigger ones uh, in Osaka, but uh, these are big enough for most institutions to use. And the fact that there's a hotel uh, nearby, which is sort of- uh, Congratulations on this project. What, a, what an awesome project, probably yeah. both uh, exciting and I suspect a little bit frightening uh, uh, initially because it really, the scale and scope of the project uh, knowing that you're, you're, you you may need 30 days to actually complete the project and then all bringing all the assets together. So, uh, you know, what a great uh, accomplishment. D did you ever imagine that when you had your independent financial services that you would become an authority and an expert on all these different technologies in order to help clients with their digital marketing in Japan? Um, I had no idea, uh, but... Uh... At the time when my my late business partner came to me, he was so excited talking about this new technology. I was sort of uh, skeptical at first, but when I saw that people were actually being um, helped with this technology and that they were walking away happy, uh, it was something that I sort of thought was missing from my work. And it was something that I really wanted to, to be part of at the time is what I thought. So yeah, seeing happy looking customers back, would like you have this done one. Anything, looking back, would you have done anything differently? Uh, yes, uh, a number of things. Uh, in the remaining time, if I could explain just a couple. Um, for instance, uh, if I was doing this again, uh, I would one, focus on niche markets uh, because while we sort of hope, had hoped at first to crack real estate, um, it was a lot of wasted time. Uh, trying to find uh, real estate agents that would use the technology. Um, it would be better uh, to focus on industries with the money uh, to spend uh, to start with. So things like architecture, engineering, uh, construction and tourism. Uh, if we'd focused on these from the beginning, uh, we would have had more success earlier on, I think. Um, also, we haven't talked about it much, but yeah, building a strong online presence is really important. Uh, most of our contacts that we get, uh, although I do spend a lot of time going and mingling, uh, networking, that sort of stuff, most of the work we get comes from people seeing our website. Uh, so the best possible marketing assets you can make are the tours themselves. Always make sure you've got permission from the client to have your tour, uh, their tour on your website. Um, people will call us or send us an email saying, hey, we want one like this one. 
and they'll send us a link to something we've already done. Uh, so yeah, the tours themselves, uh, buy more tours. That's something you really, really need to uh, tackle. So if I could recommend a way to uh, display your tours on the website, I think even now that uh, the We Get Around Network has some sort of connection with WP3D models, um, we use their um, their their page uh, for displaying all the tours that we've done with categories. Um, and finally, what I would recommend if we were starting if you were starting over and uh, doing it now, uh, I would develop strategic partnerships with other businesses uh, rather than just trying to fight it on your own. Uh, for instance, uh, video video videographers and photographers, uh, your service can be an add-on for theirs and vice versa. Uh, also, web page makers and marketing agencies, um, in particularly with the web page makers, without their cooperation, you'll find that the tour that you make goes on some, you know, page that you have to click three or four times to get to and never gets see, never sees the light of day. So you've always got to make sure you connect with these people so they know how to display your page to start with. But also, uh, these people, if they're satisfied, they'll call you in to do other new clients that they get as well. And that's true of marketers as well. Often the marketers don't know how to use the um, tours successfully. They're thinking about, hey, I can't use this on SNS, so what do I do? And then you have to sort of teach them how to do that. But once they know that, they'll start calling you in for more projects. Awesome. Uh, I've, I've enjoyed hearing about your journey today. Uh, thank you for being on the show today. Thank you very much. We've been visiting with Daniel Brown with My Dancha. Uh, Daniel is based in Osaka, but actually covers all of Japan, just a train ride away from everything. Uh, check out his website, mydansha-co.com. Arigato gozaimasu, Daniel. Arigato gozaimasu. Thank you. Doitashimaste. Oh, that's wonderful. Very good. <laughs> For Daniel in Osaka, I'm Dan, and you've been watching WGAN-TV live at 5.